Welcome back to Mages and Murder Dads, the best show dedicated to the Baldur's Gate franchise and beyond. We're playing Disco Elysium. I'm Cameron. And and I'm Danny. What are you doing over there? <sighs> well, it's a lot because my, my first instinct is to say, and I'm Danny, and I play Balthazar, and I was actually thrown off because you didn't you didn't say who you were, but well, yeah, <laughs> I guess this is the conundrum we're faced with, mm -hmm. right? I'm theoretical Ticklevar, but not literal Ticklevar because we don't have those options. No, and here's the thing: I think when I think about uh, Ticklevar, there there's some big adjectives that um that stick out: bootlicker. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Might be one of them. Mm -hmm. Belt enthusiast. Belt enthusiast. Uh, I think that the universe we find ourselves uh, in this series now, uh, it's just, you know, it's really stretching our conceptions of who our, our little headcanon people are. So so what game are we playing these days? We're playing Disco Elysium. This is episode two of Disco Elysium. Um, and if you didn't listen to the last episode, you should probably do that. I don't yeah. know what you're going to get out of this episode. <laughs> nothing. Didn't listen just to hot one. nothing. Yeah, probably not a lot. But uh, I am playing in, in the, the Mages and Murder Dead spirit. Someone, uh, you know, uh, an amnesiac. Well, actually, how about this? Danny, what is the plot so far? Okay, here we go. We have awakened... Uh, in a trashed hotel room, we are probably a late 40s to mid 50s, uh, just alcoholic um, man. Uh, we aren't in that great a shape. We, we're definitely we're dealing with some pretty, pretty pronounced uh, issues. We can't remember anything. And we have discovered that we were sent here uh, to investigate a murder. Another cop from another precinct named Kim Kitsuragi uh, has joined us to investigate this murder. And we basically ended uh, the last episode as we attempted to get a corpse out of a tree because the, the, the murder victim was uh, hanged. And we were able to both successfully shoot the corpse out of the tree or were you did you encourage kim to do it or did you do it yourself i did it myself mm -hmm. so we both we both shot the corpse out of the tree and uh this episode we, we kind of start with uh you know i guess with a, with a with a corpse directly in front of us and this is kind of the the, the broad strokes i would say of our situation yeah. Uh, two things to say about that really quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. So w the first thing is that we're approaching it slightly differently. I'm playing a little bit more of a, uh, you know, true believer cop mm. cop. And you're playing a, perhaps a little bit more of a, uh, I don't know, a bit of a, a, a someone who is on the other end of their professional career. Yeah, I'm a, I, I fancy myself as a bit of a rock star. Mm. I fancy myself as a, as, as a, as a true rebel. You know, mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck. Mm. I think. Wow. So, mm -hmm. um, and the uh, the other thing I w just wanted to say really briefly is that uh, I think there's a big difference between Disco Elysium and many of the other games we've been playing in Mages and Murder Dads. If you'll go back and listen, for example, to the Torment Tides of Numenera episodes where I had Danny summarize the plot, um, uh, you could hear uh, despair in his voice the whole time. <laughs> it's not it's not wrong. And there's not any despair in in your description currently so far. We'll see how that goes. You know, there's still time. Yeah, but, there uh, is still time. But I, I think that that is like an interesting little comparison point. Only other thing I would say is aside from the uh, true believer cop that we have on your side, and there's a couple of other, there's a couple other little idiosyncrasies about your character that we'll probably get into in, in this podcast. Um, there's also a pretty big mechanical difference. We're kind of mirror images of uh, right, kind of inverse type characters in a way mm -hmm. uh, you you're really uh you're really like mentally and emotionally connected with the world I yes say. Yeah. but but you're but you're not super strong or svelte no no mm -hmm. not not even a little bit and i am the opposite i am a uh trapped in a in a cracking glass cage of emotion that i'm not able to relate with at all i have as uh, as a therapist would say i have no insight whatsoever 
Mm-hmm. Um, but I am just built like a like a 1970s refrigerator with all of the agility of a uh, you know an obstacle course runner on on like American Gladiator. I really wanted you to say that you had all the agility of a 1970s refrigerator <laughs> 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 with all the agility of a softball of a human sized <laughs> softball. Yeah. Um, but uh but yeah well so that's that's the general approach I, I, uh and we got to do this autopsy so how'd the autopsy go for you it was kind of interesting i had several points in the autopsy where my logic or visual calculus came up and it was mm-hmm. just an immediate fail and it was like you don't even have a joke here <laughs> you have no idea what's going on um, yeah, I'm actually really curious because, uh, you know, during this autopsy for me, right, so much of what's happening here, because what, you know, what's going on is that, uh, narratively Kim Kutsuragi says, Hey, I'm going to do like the manual handiwork here. Here is the sheet of paper, the paperwork we need to fill out. Mm-hmm. You fill it out for me, ask me the appropriate questions and I'll do it. So, so you're kind of, this is for the most part, although I'm sure that changes in some points for both of us. For the most part, this is you as a player directing the autopsy, right? Yes. Kind of like through the perspective of your character. Uh, notably for me, I did not have my own paperwork and I had to own up to that and take, I think, I think I took a morale hit. Oh, <laughs> that's interesting. That. I rooted yeah. through the garbage oh. in, the, in the dumpster near the, uh, near the corpse. I was, I was, it was, it was very important for me to get into the dumpster and I found uh, a couple of items. I found my logbook, So that's nice. Mm-hmm. And I also found a uh, a racist coffee mug. That's going to come back, or at least for me, that comes back this episode. Oh wow, interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. So, in any case, you had to borrow the logbook. I had the logbook, but we're, you're right. We're the game. I think that this is relatively clever because the whole we're st- it's we're both the as the game player and as the character in the game. Neither of us know the official. Uh, you know, Revachal militia um, procedures for an autopsy. Kim mm-hmm. basically says, "Hey, this is how you do it. Just read these out and and fill it in what I what I find here." So that's kind of how this is framed. Yeah. So uh, walk me through it. Uh, you know, I've got some highlights for um, from things I think uniquely happened to me, but uh, you know, just just give me your general vibes here. Yeah. So the autopsy has three parts and like a little introductory part. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you kind of the the big picture stuff. So obviously we don't know the identity of this person. We're looking in like a, um, you know, Kim's describing this person, male, 50s, uh, looks like a very athletic build. Um, I think immediately we both thought, oh, this looks like a mercenary or an ex-soldier or something. And that's verified, or at least that, that opinion or theory is bolstered by the fact that... Um, there's a lot of like battle wounds, like bullet wounds and other stuff uh, that we find during the course of the autopsy. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of injuries that appear to have been, you know, the, the the we find on the body, we see a couple of kind of pecking marks, and we're thinking, oh, probably some kind of scavenger like birds because he's been up there for a very long time, and it's not my fault that he's been up there so long. Stop blaming me. Okay. Um, uh, there are a couple of uh, this was really funny. There were a couple of low velocity like impacts that appear <laughs> to be post mortem, and Kuno immediately interjects. He's like, "What the fuck are you talking about? Those are maximum velocity impacts." And there's actually an opportunity as you're writing where Kim's like repeats himself. He says low velocity, and you can write in the notes maximum velocity mm-hmm. impacts. What so did you, you do? I just put. Regular impacts. What'd wow. you do? You're a you're a rebel, but not too much of a rebel. It's true. That's true. Mm, I, I put I I did everything in here directly by the book as much as I could until things got weird, and so mm. th- then I didn't anymore. Um, um I, there's well, a tattoo. I, there's, there's a tattoo. tattoo yeah. Of uh, it appears to be a night sky, but weirdly with some stars omitted. Um, there are. Uh, yeah, and then finally we have the um, the ligature marks around the neck, which are kind of indicative of the hanging. 
Um, and mm -hmm. that's all I'll say so far, but I will say there was one option that I was locked out of, uh, and that option, and it required like a higher inland empire to accomplish. And that was asking the corpse, who are you? Yeah. Who are you, dead man? Mm -hmm. So did you, uh, you, I imagine you had that option because you've got high empathy, right? I did. And we, and we talked about this last time, I think, because I think you can ask, who are you, dead man, when he's still up in the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think at the end of the last episode, it's been it's been you know a week and a half or so since we recorded that last episode. But I believe in the end of that last episode, I said you know I didn't say it then because I didn't want to like blow the chance at it. You know, so mm. I let it go. Um, and so I was kind of saving up, right? And I, kind of on purpose because I knew in this episode we were going to do several different things. And I wanted to be able to, um, uh, you know, do it and have high enough inland empire where it would do something, right? So I was really kind of purposefully. Uh, not taking the opportunity until I thought that maybe I could pass it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I saved it basically for the very end. Um, some other stuff that came up in general before I talk about Inland Empire. Yeah. We, we learned we um, learned that he's from Mondial or that he is Mondial. Yes, which, I wrote that down. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and that was specifically in response to race. Yes. And so, I mean, because uh, something I didn't say at the beginning, right? But because I'm playing uh, my character as... Someone who's like all in on racism in the game to kind of mm -hmm. figure out what's going on with that and how the game is, is thinking about it. Um, this is the first of like a million racial categorizations and nationalities that get associated with race all throughout the game. Those are going to come up later in this episode. Um, mm -hmm. So so uh, there was that. Um, weirdly enough, during the general autopsy, my authority um, skill, capability, whatever that's kind of called, uh, that part of my character kept trying to speak up and, and tell me how to do the investigation. Mm. Um, so it was discouraging me from asking questions or, or not being decisive. Um, and it was saying, no, what you need to do is you need to be very clear about what your position is because that's how you establish authority. So uh, some, it, it was kind of like this third voice, you know, in the, in the autopsy um, occasionally, which I thought was really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. That's interesting. I did have some voices interjecting, but they were usually a uh, physical instrument or half-life. They were, they were my physique side, basically having insight into the condition of the body. Mm. Mm -hmm. So like the sausage fingers, I, I definitely had a condition, I like several impressions of like what this body was like when it was alive, which was a man of violence was the impression that I got. Oh. Yeah, I didn't get any of that. Kim, basically all the information I got of that sort was just what Kim told me, right? Mm. When he, you know, he says something to the effect, or maybe I actually pulled this out with like visual calculus, but like 20% of the body is covered in scar or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I can't remember how I exactly learned that, but I didn't really get anything about like, you know, his, like a real, real thinking about his physique, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, the other thing I'm, I'm trying to look at my notes here. The other thing I did is that I stroked the man's hair. Oh, interesting. Did you do that? No, I did not. Did you have the option to do it? I did. Okay. Uh, so I did that and like a little bit of an inland empire thing happened there, but because I did that, so I basically went through the whole autopsy, and at the end, my last kind of thing I could do before we kind of moved on, um, I was saving my, uh, you know, uh, tell me who you are, dead man choice. Mm -hmm. And because I performed, I, I forget exactly what it was called, um, uh, intimately, an intimate autop autopsy, I got a bonus to my Inland Empire. Oh. Uh, and so then I went for it, and then I could speak to the dead man. Um, and he doesn't really give you much more information than what you have. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for Inland Empire, it's unclear, right? Like, are you actually talking to another entity? Are you talking to your own fantasy of the thing? Right. It, yeah. It's kind of in this middle of the road thing. And very much, I mean, Inland Empire is, uh, I, you know, it's a direct David Lynch reference here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's this intermediate space of, of dreaminess that, that we don't really have a good, um, you know, a handle on where it comes from. It's numinous, right? It's just happening. Mm -hmm. um, but it's coming from somewhere else uh, that's mediated by the person who's seeing it. But that's all to say that the thing that was interesting is that um, he told me that, because I, I said, you know, who killed you? And he said, love did me in. 
Mm. And I was able to say, hey, wait a minute. When you were falling, you know, after I <laughs> shot you down, you told me communism killed you. And you said, yeah, that's what I said. Communism killed me, but love did me in. Dang. Yeah. And then that was kind of it. You know, you gave me a little bit more information, but that was kind of the big um, the big vibe and the big note I wrote down from it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think I, there we're were, going to yeah. get answers to this question about like how quote unquote real, how external is Inland Empire? Um, because mm-hmm. I think when you're playing through this the first time, it's going to be an open question. Like I was I was, you know, I was asking myself the very first time I, pl- I played this. Um, you know, is this just fucking with me? Like, is this, is this just completely, uh, you know, conspiratorial, right? Yeah. Which I think that it, it could be 100% on brand calling it that, that that could be what it is. And it could certainly open up different interactions, but, you know, grain of salt. So I think that this is going to be a question that hopefully gets answered is like, how real is this? Yeah, I... Yeah, maybe we can we'll kick that forward and talk about it, um, you know, later when we get stronger answers. But I think that, you know, something like Shivers, for example, that you get, Mm -hmm. there's a question there, too, about how real is that information to to my mind. Right. I haven't seen a lot of that, um, obviously, in this play, because I don't Mm -hmm. really have any skill there. But the first time I played the game, I remember Shivers all the time being like, you know, somewhere else in the city, something Mm -hmm. XYZ has happened or is happening. And that's having like a butterfly effect on you. Yeah. Um, and that to me, you know, they, they feel complimentary to me and like, they could be real, they could not be, but, um, you know, that, that information is grounded in you somewhere, right? For me, it's in the psyche for my character. It's in the psyche and for you, it's in the body, mm-hmm. but in that heuristic, right? Those things are real. Mm-hmm. Um, or they, you know, they at least seem to be real. But anyway, that's the the big thing I think I got from that. I had a really interesting moment where I was trying to use rhetoric to make a claim, mm-hmm. and it failed. And then drama and volition showed up to explain why I failed. Oh, that like, dang. That, like, rhetoric's just not good enough. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't have a good enough um, handle on reality <laughs> <laughs> to, like, uh, to command the situation. Um. The, um, I couldn't get the, um, so, so basically there is a task because he's been, you know, hanged in this tree by a, um, a belt that is like lined in steel. And so you have to use the bolt cutters to get it off of his neck in order to like check out that wound. That's and, right. And I couldn't do it. I kind of like, you know, fucked up the wound a little bit. Oh, and no. Like, and Kim had to take it from me and do it himself. So I uh, did not get, you know, whatever the full information is you're, you could get there. I did not get that at all. Um, were you able to remove that rope? I was. Super easy. That was an easy check for me. Although mm-hmm. uh, both Kuno and Kuno S um, were like, oh, no. Like, and they oftentimes interact with you whenever you're trying to do something tricky with the corpse anticipating mm-hmm. your failure yeah they're giving you a bunch of shits well, well so then what is your what was your final diagnosis of the whole situation what, what's cause of death um that kind of thing um it got it uh, we revised it at the end hmm. so initially we said okay pretty clear cause of death um ligature marks uh around the neck so death by hanging basically mm-hmm. And I'm looking at the actual, you know, uh, text here. And I believe it was a yellow check, which yellow is, um, what statistic is that? Is that? Uh, I was going to say volition, but that's, that's not right. Um, uh, dexterity. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of the dexterity. I, I forget what the, uh what the actual thing is but that's like your reaction speed my reaction speed said um said hey before you check this box motorix motorix god that's yeah no one is ever going to remember that (laughs) yeah intellect psyche physique (laughs) motorix i I also can't remember it Mm -hmm. uh reaction speed said hey think for a second there's time don't rush and then physical instrument immediately responded with a challenging check which i succeeded on and says what was that about no clawing around the neck you'd be clawing for your life around your neck Hmm. and so initially I said, okay, well, I do think it was a fatal inner injury. 
And, uh, you know, Kim's like, okay, I'm pretty satisfied with that. That's a pretty easy, you know, easy answer to this. And I said, uh, you know, how, how do you feel like this um, autopsy went, Kim? And says, like, hey, we were thorough. We found our, um, we found our answer about um, what we need to do. My electrochemistry interjects and says, hey, it's time for a drink. And I, I, I tell Kim, hey, maybe, I, maybe you want to get a drink and celebrate our success? Kim basically responds, you know, that's worry. You will die if you drink, <laughs> Kim, Kim responds. Like, it is so obvious to everyone around you, like, in how bad a shape you're in. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we move the, okay, so I, was like, I, I relent, and we move the conversation along. And then something very strange happens. I rip out the autopsy pages and we're saying, okay, we need to move this to the car. And there is a perception check that is legendary. It requires a 14 to succeed. And the perception check says, search the body one more time thoroughly. Hmm. Uh, and I, it, I have an 8% chance to uh, succeed, and I succeed. Whoa. Yeah, so this is like, this is a huge, um, huge break in the case for me. Now, do you want to talk about what I find? Because this is going to, where our paths are going to diverge a little bit, I think. Well, let me talk about what, what I find, right? Yeah. And, and then we'll go, because I, I, think, I think so. And mm-hmm. Even though it will tell us kind of a lot about the mystery, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I, um, I'm going through it, right? I find, you know, I, I, I have this information from the dead man. And unlike you, remember, I looked at all those footprints and I can mm-hmm. like remember all that information. Mm-hmm. And so when we get to cause of death, I say, you know, I, we don't know. And the reason we do not know is because of all those footprints, right? There's no way um, that this person was killed via hanging with all that extra information that we know, right? Mm. And so Kim says, well, like, look, this, this body is decaying, right? We, we have to do something with it. And so much like you at the end of the conversation, he's like, look, let's take it to the car and then I'll drive it, you know, tomorrow morning, and then I'll come back, and then we'll like learn more about the case. And I was like, "Oh, okay." And he was like, "Or we could try to put it in a refrigerator so we could look at it later." And he says, "There's a couple of refrigeration places you can go to Freet, uh, you know, like the Seven Eleven, mm-hmm. or you can go to um, uh, the Whirling and Rags, the the cafeteria, mm-hmm. and see if you can use their use their refrigerator." And I went to both of those places, and they told me no, and I did not have the capability to argue about it. And so I shipped it off, and currently I have no, um, you know, no cause of death reported, and also have no access to the body to do this again. So Ooh. that is the end of my, you know, investigation as far as the body itself is concerned. I'm going to have to find information in other places. But That's, you, mm. legendarily, <laughs> legendarily, uh, have a different thing. So yeah, what did you learn? Um, So I tilt my head and look at the corpse and I put on my gardener's glove and I start looking around in the mouth and I just start feeling around and it's a very, it's very gross, (laughs) right? It's Mm -hmm. very, there's a lot of like very kind of uh, detailed, explicit language about like the, the ball like tongue and like how it's lolling around and, uh, and it's almost like my dialogue options are like, this feels right. So I am recalling kind of unconscious memories of my own autopsies that I've performed in the past. And I am acting almost purely on instinct. And my perception check comes in and says, oh, you feel something. And I just jerk this jaw so far open and shove my hand so far in. And I feel a hole in the back of the of the throat hmm. uh, no larger than uh, less than half a centimeter in radius and um and kim's like whoa keep going <laughs> <laughs> uh and uh, as i do it some you get some blood coming out of there and i pull a bullet out of there oh yeah I literally, there's one more small check to get the bullet out, but it was much easier um, than the initial check to, like, 
notice something wrong. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, I pull like a jagged little bullet out of there and we bag it. And we edit our notes to say cause of death, uh, firearm or, you know, bullet. Yeah, shot. So basically the, the implication here is shot in the open mouth. Shot in the open mouth because there was no exit wound. The entry mm-hmm. wound is directly in the back of the throat and the bullet was like still back there in, the, in like the back of the brain before uh, exiting. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's mysterious. So, I mean, what is what are your ideas about where that came from? Like, you know, does your character say anything or does Kim say anything? Yeah, or? so Kim says, okay, we're going to edit our notes in two places. One, cause of death, edit that to be the cause of death. And two, we say, okay, this we, we are now going to classify the hanging as treatment, basically. Oh, yeah. Okay. We're going to classify the hanging as this was this happened post- uh, Post mortem and solely to uh, to get, give the impression that something happened that didn't actually happen. Hmm. Um, now, I, I asked Kim, "Is like why on earth would this happen?" And Kim was like, "This all seemed suspicious to me, frankly." Kim kind of expressed like the fact that it was all kind of too simple. It was all too out in the open. He had his suspicions from the beginning, but. Um, yeah, I did get a bullet, and I examined the bullet. I could not get too much. There is a um, there's a hand eye coordination check that I tried and failed to identify like the firearm. Uh, but I think one of the reasons why I failed it is like I don't have visual calculus or like logic or, or a different kind of encyclopedic knowledge. Mm-hmm. So I bet that check would have been easier had I even had the kind of skill to attempt it. So I've got, I've got the bullet. We're going to be trying. Like one thing about the bullet that Kim noted, which kind of gives us a an impression of like what the technological level is vis-a-vis firearms in this world. Kim said, uh, oh, wow, this has a, a hardened jacket around it. It's a conical round um, with, a, with a hardened jacket and a soft core. And Kim's like, oh, that's some real military grade stuff. Like even the dock workers here that would have firearms, they would have, uh, you know, they would have muzzle loaders with uh, spherical rounds that are that don't have that jacket. Uh, whereas this would come from a breech loader, he would say. Hmm. So we're already so Kim's like all pretty pleased with that because Kim's like this is a unique round. You know, not necessarily everyone would have this kind of weapon. Hmm. Yeah, you learned a whole lot more than I did. I did. <laughs> like a way more than I did. Well, I learned a lot about myself. So, ha ha. <laughs> it's true. I mean, this is a very interesting little, like, in terms of game design, is having the option to give give up the ghost <laughs> this much? Like, where are you on that? Well, I, I guess what's interesting about it is you don't, you, you don't really know any more than I do as far mm-hmm. as like, I, I mean, you know exactly what killed him, right? Mm-hmm. But I also know what killed him. Mm-hmm. Love, love didn't him in and communism killed him. That's true. That 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 is different information, but no less, you know, no less important or insightful, we'll say. Yeah, and I think, I, I mean, you know, something that, that Kim's trying to figure out and something that, you know, we, along with Kim, we're trying to figure out how did the, the person actually die, right? And we're at the same location in a general sense, right, of the hanging is not what killed the person, mm-hmm. right? Like, we're all on board with that. Yeah, you uh, were able to get there because of all of those feet, whereas I looked at the feet and got a headache and had a panic attack because exactly. I, I, it was too much. <laughs> Um, and then neither of us are any closer to something like motive, right? No. And who did it? So in, in some ways, what's interesting is that it is so wildly divergent. And, you know, we've played the game before. We know that that, that bullet is important, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, it killed the, the main <laughs> mystery person. Obviously, it's important, right? But um, but so is, like, everything else that we've just talked about here, right? Those yeah. all fit into kind of a, a, a broad system, of the end of the game. So what's interesting to me is I think that while the exact information that we have is very different, obviously they are parallel facts in that 
no, one doesn't really get us any further than the other, although one feels much more concrete than the other one does. Yes. Um, you know, I think that something that the game is doing across the board is saying that the information you get, this is kind of what we were talking about before, right? The information you get from something like Shivers or the information you get from something like Inland Empire is like equivalent to the information you get from visual calculus or the information you get from, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, the thing that gives you endurance. I can't remember what that's called. Yeah. Um, half light or yeah. Mm -hmm. Might just um, be actually, there is, there's actually a skill with all of the very specific skill names. There's actually a skill just called endurance. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so maybe that's it. Right. But the thing that like allows you to kind of know more about the body and damage mm -hmm. and things like it, something mm -hmm. we think of as very material, right. Mm -hmm. In the way that visual calculus is very material when, when it happens in the game. Yeah. And um, I also yeah. think that speaking to the way the mystery is constructed, I think, everything every little piece matters so we're we have we're about to go speak with a union boss in this episode and the dynamic that is playing out with the union and within the union and like uh the union against some of the forces that are kind of conspiring against it um you know those things matter the relationship between uh, the people in this hotel matters. All of these little things are going to like get us there. So I think you're right. We have very specific, different pieces of information, but we're each slowly kind of filling our vessel of knowledge about this place and how things are connected here. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, well, then let's talk about that. I mean, so we, we have both ended this the same way. Did you end up storing the body or did you go ahead and ship it to the precinct? We did, um, we put it in Kim's uh, car. Yep. Um, and he said, and he, I, he said, yeah, it's a little too late in the day for me to send it to the precinct, but I'll do it tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And basically the idea is that by the time you wake up tomorrow morning, he will have already done it. So the game kind of solves that for you. Yeah. Um, um, I think the yep. reason why you were unable to refrigerate the body is uh you i think you there is like one refrigerator you can discover um on a side quest yeah so I think that was mm -hmm. that was my assumption is that mm -hmm. there there was some missing that kim didn't have all the information at hand and then i then i also didn't either mm -hmm. and um you know i was i was uh in these episodes you know we're a little bit um uh what do you call it uh goal directed <laughs> and mm -hmm. so you know i wasn't running around looking for a refrigerator so. no no but also i think i'm also like i know where that refrigerator is but i don't but like if i were in your position i'm going to play it as if i don't know because we are trying because this is a mystery we're trying to give it a, an organic feeling playthrough um well even in my last playthrough i didn't I never found this refrigerator, so mm. even if I had that information, I was not <laughs> able to access it. Okay. Um, uh, I but, did speak to uh, someone you spoke to last episode, just to kind of catch up. Mm-hmm. And I spoke to the racist lorry driver. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had Kim's back at the beginning, and I asked her, the racist lorry driver, like, hey, what is this nonsense you're talking about? And he, like, starts to describe the things you were describing last episode where it's an obvious analog to this, like, great replacement issue of, like, this formerly great race that apparently he and I belong to. So here's mm -hmm. my first question. Is your interpretation that we... Are we Mondials? Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. it. So you believe we're the same race as the uh the the body yeah i mean uh mondial is uh you know i got this during the information that that uh during the autopsy right but, mm -hmm. but something you know one of the figures in my head says mondial just means white oh okay i didn't so know it's like it's, ca it's caucasian essentially or you mm -hmm. know middle european whatever mm -hmm. um yeah so so yeah mondial is explicitly like this um, it, much like Caucasian, right? This kind of invented term mm -hmm. um, d that describes whiteness in the way that um, uh, some of the other nationalities that we get, right, do not describe whiteness. They uh, And nationalities and races are specifically kind of geared toward, I don't know, exoticizing people. Um, we, we do see, yeah. I think, throughout this episode, we're, I'm, I'm, our conception of this particular idea, which there are a lot of... There are a lot of little systems or sociologies 
Mm -hmm. that you kind of slowly build up when playing this game. One is this conception of race and like where race and culture and nationality, like what that Venn diagram looks like. You're all, you're also, if you're curious, you start to get like this conception of the way um, kind of class struggle is, uh, is um, contextualized in the game. And then you also get like just kind of the overarching history, which probably subsumes those things. But it seems like we are, I am called at one point also Occidental. So I think that Mondials are Occidental, but Mm -hmm. perhaps not all Occidental people are Mondial. Correct. The Mm -hmm. Simonese have to be, I believe they have to be Occidental. And Simonese are basically the the games like Allegory or, uh, I mean... The way the way the game handles its analogs to real life are, is is interesting, and so in some ways we can reduce it that way, in some ways we can't. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, they're, they're, it's functionally the Caribbean. Um, mm. You know, it's specifically the islands. There's specifically a long form colonial relationship between the two. The Simonese were the original people who lived in the archipelago of Revachal, so that is kind of post colonization in some ways. Mm. Um, but now that now kind of way, I, I think we're meant to understand this is now thousands of years after colonization that that relationship has gotten complicated, um, or like not not the the situation of colonialism, but the situation of um, are the Simonese uh occidental or are are they not and things like that Mm -hmm. so yeah the the kind of questions of in real life where we would say there's a distinction between things like race ethnicity and nationality but those things often get collapsed all the time um you know in our day-to-day conversation especially when people are talking about those things and in politicized ways um those in the those ideas and categories in this game are getting collapsed in all kinds of weird um, ways and so when you see the racist characters because there are a few that are going to show up mm-hmm. they are i mean it's it's rhetoric right they are bending these ideas toward their kind of view of the world um whereas whereas i don't get the sense that that the quote-unquote anti-racist characters although there aren't very many people that are flagged that way mm-hmm. if any who are flagged that way in the game it, we get a sense that they are less rhetorically interested in positioning you know it, we get a sense that the racism is an ideology Mm-hmm. And that then there's everyone else. And yeah, that, I don't know if that really fits into the the real world. It's but. interesting Kim's reaction. So the the conversation just plays out. He says like a few things, and uh, I don't have logic like intervening to tell me the historical context of any of them. Mm-hmm. So eventually, I was like, "You can go fuck yourself." I tell. <laughs> And uh, after the conversation, like, I have a thought and, like, I initiate uh, dialogue with Kim. And I was like, man, it feels great to tell people to go fuck themselves. And Kim's like, generally, that's uh, unprofessional. But in this case, it was probably okay. And I even had, like, a thing in my thought cabinet that was like, you are a you are a, a flamethrower and the world is a wooden shack. You need to, tell, <laughs> you need to speak your mind more. <laughs> Um, but it was interesting during the conversation with the racist lorry driver that Kim's uh, like response is, "Hey, we're all uh, you know we're all a part of this you know this state in limbo. People are just hardworking, um, you know. Uh, we, you, you, people like you just sow division and make it difficult for uh, for us all to get along." That was kind of Kim's version of anti-racism. Yeah, when we. <laughs> When repeatedly, and at least in my version, right, the uh, Kim's first response is is not, you know, you know, fuck you, you're a racist. His response is, well, we're all Martin A. You know, I my family came here, yes, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago or whatever, and uh, so that should be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so there's a little bit, a little bit of that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that. Um, I don't think that Kim's politics, at least here at the beginning of the game, are what we would call like anti-racist. I think he's just a good liberal. Yes, um, and I think you know, we're going to find more and more out about Kim. One one little insight as far as like who Kim is that I picked up that I don't know if you did. He did something that the game called a pre-Delorean burial rite. Hmm. Did you catch that? No, but I, I, I do have a sense of what the dollarites are and yeah. or DeLorean stuff mm-hmm. is, but no, I, I don't... Uh, yeah, he just, like, touched uh, he touched his chest before, like, interacting with the body. 
Hmm. Um, so there is like a, the the only impression I have as far as like where Kim is in terms of the way he interacts with the world or kind of the background beliefs he's operating under is I know that he probably has like a certain religious or at least traditional bent because this is pre DeLorean. I don't know. I, don't, I have no idea what that means yet in this character. Mm-hmm. And also that, uh, that yeah, he, he does seem also he, he was like, well, you know, Racist, you can't tell me what to do. Actually, I'm a cop, and it's my job to tell you what to do. So maybe you yeah. should think about that. Yeah, uh, I've, I've Kim has said some version of that a couple times mm-hmm. in my game so far. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think he d- he is going to change as a character in the same way that we are going to change his, his characters. I think, and so, yeah. but but I think this conversation is like talking to the racist lorry driver near the beginning of the game is very important because it it is used to reveal kind of where you are, and mm-hmm. that's determined through choice. And it's kind of setting the standard of where Kim is at the beginning of the thing. And, um, you know, he has as much, I think, potential to change what he's up to as, as you do. Yeah. Um, um, but, yeah, uh, otherwise I just wanted to put that in there because I know you already spoke to him. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I guess we got to, like, find a way into the docks, right? Yeah. So you know, we want to talk to Everard Clare, who is the union boss. And the reason we want to do that is we think the union is involved. Um, mm-hmm. Or... Alternately, the union has information. I mean, there's a few different reasons that we want to talk to him. It's in our quest log from the very beginning of the game. Um, and uh, there's a couple ways to get there. How did you How did you get in there? Well, I did swipe an ID card from the sleeping dock worker in the hotel lobby. Oh. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that I found, like, I couldn't use that that to get in because I when I went and talked to uh I believe his name is a uh, call me manana mm-hmm. the um kind of like uh the staunch socialist um of of the union he's he's called by Claire later uh I do try to be like hey i could you let me in I've got a ID card and he just looked at it, he's like that's not you and I was like oh. <laughs> yeah huh. I wonder if there's a photo booth somewhere where you can get it it might be um or I think that there's also maybe an alternate way in that requires a different check that would get me to the correct door in order to mm. do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, something like that. But yeah, I, I wasn't able to use that. I had to go, uh, you know, I had to, I talked to call me manana and he was a cool guy. I asked him for some money and he like flipped a coin to me and I hand eye coordinationed it out of the air. Um, not as effective as you talking to that rich woman on the boat. Yeah. No, it's not. I went back and talked to her. Or, or yeah, I think we we purposely went back and talked to her at this point. Yeah, um, um, for this episode. But um, yeah, and ju- just really, really uh, briefly, because I'm <laughs> I think we mentioned it last time, but I don't think we got into it. The reason that we can't just walk into the union office is that the dock is currently closed the, due to a strike. Due to a strike, and so there, the dock workers are striking at the you know decision slash behest of the union. And there is a protest of literally right to work workers. They're in, literally in the called front. scabs, like in their like identity. Like yeah. scab yeah, leader is is one you can talk to. Yeah. So so what's happening is that yeah, it's the gates are closed, so you can't walk right in, and there's a protest. And so there's all of these kind of security measures. One assumes that those security measures are always happening, but it's especially locked down right now. And so mm-hmm. we have to kind of find these ways in. And you have tried to go through uh, Call Me Manana, and that didn't work. Um, so, yeah, what else did you try? Well, Call Me Manana said, well, it's, it's actually quite easy to get into the docks. All you got to do is hit that button up there. Um, you've got to go up there to a man named Measurehead, mm-hmm. and you need to go move 20 centimeters past him and hit a button, and then move back past him. Uh, so I, I guess in order to do that, you either need to physically overcome him or in some way understand and adopt his uh Simonese supremacy and then he kind of like contemplates it in a second he's like maybe that is impossible <laughs> um so yeah i went and talked to measurehead i'm assuming you you did not become a Simonese supremacist i have no i just had no like mental fortitude to like stand through r- reading all of his nonsense he called me a uh, a degenerate Yes, he calls you a degenerate quite often. Mm-hmm. Um, 
a, like I, a true can... a true like kind of uh i've kind of like betrayed my my race basically by allowing myself to physically it seems like it was both directed at uh me personally like the idea that i'm an alcoholic like he specifically yeah. says i have i'm in the the you know the grasp of al ghul yeah um but also i get the impression that he's referring kind of to the whole uh mondial race as well as like a ham sandwich race uh it seems yes. like his perspective is that we have we've like all fallen into degeneracy and we're just obsessed with pop culture now yeah so i mean so i went deep obviously oh um, my god uh, this is you know. okay yeah i i mean yeah because yeah, that's the character i'm playing right sure. i was like oh yeah sounds like a pretty good idea why don't you let me know so measure heads whole deal is exactly what you, what you're saying right mm-hmm. Um, he believes that kind of the uh, I think it's the the Mondialians, but the mm-hmm. the you know the European stand-ins here, mm-hmm. Central European stand-ins, that their biggest contribution to the world was eugenics. I do remember him saying that, and he lists some other like military technology. Yes, mm-hmm. um, and so their their biggest contribution to the world is eugenics, which gives a system for understanding like a hierarchy of the races, and then he says. With that, right, um, and also, I mean, he's called Measurehead, right? It's it's physiognomy, mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, uh, phren- uh, phrenology specifically, but physiognomy in a general sense. Um, and uh, so, yeah, he's like way bought in on that. And he basically tells me, hey, um, if you want to get in here and you want to be able to like do stuff that is here, um, I need you to, uh, you know, Think of my. Hold on. Let me let me give you the exact right word. He he gives you a, a thought catalog racism option. I I don't have the term written down unfortunately, mm-hmm. um, but uh, but basically it requires you to spend two hours thinking about race and racism. Um, he's trying to get you to think of the mystery. Hold on. I need to actually look it up because the word is very specific. So yeah, Measurehead requires you to think about racism for two hours in order to get this idea called advanced race theory inside of your um, inside your thought uh, cabinet. Mm-hmm. Um, and his reason for that is this, right? So he keeps calling uh, me both a ham sandwich, right? He's saying that white people are a quote unquote ham, ham sandwich race, mm-hmm. um, and but but specifically. Occidental haplogroup B4, right? Mm. So, like, Measurehead only understands, like, the world within this, like, very specific eugenicized system. Importantly, too, right, Measurehead is Simonese. So, you know, in the real world, he's a black man. Um, uh, And so, and that's kind of what Simonese gets used for, uh, even though it's theoretically a nationality. Uh, Again, all these things kind of get confused. Mm So, um, anyway, so he tells me I have to do that. And I said, well, uh, okay. (laughs) <laughs> that sounds fine. So I went and did that and kind of like walked around. I, I did another uh, kind of uh, task that that uh, we're covering in this episode. Um, but there's something. Well, I, I'll I guess I'll talk about this at the end. So anyway, I go back to him and I'm like, all right. I, I thought about this and he wants me to um, tell him about like the miss the 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 mystery of race theory. Mm. Like like how do I do it? Uh, and like how does it work and so i started like working through this racial typology that he's interested in that's what this thought catalog gives me access to um um i'm I'm just looking through my notes about the stuff Mm -hmm. um i mean i can tell just from the fact that like this is a very you're, you're kind of leaning on your notes i don't think it's because it's been several weeks since you've played i think it's just because this is hyper specific like it took 30 minutes yeah it took 30 minutes to play i mean it's a huge and this is even before i actually did the um the thought cabinet stuff um it's just a huge amount of dialogue to kind of go through and have to listen to him talk about his like race science is this game punishing people for like choosing the racist option like is that an interpretation for what's happening i i mean i think so or i i don't know if it's punishing you but i think it is saying that the more that you sit and listen to this like truly horseshit race you know it's it's fictional quite literally yeah. right in mm-hmm. but but fictional in the the sense of the game but also fictional as in the um in the real world or, or you know 
is fictional in the sense that the game is fictional. Yeah. It is also fictional within the context of the game because after I spent two hours thinking about advanced race theory, I came back and my conclusion was that it's all arbitrary and made up. Mm. I was able to be like, yeah, this is just free association. Like there's nothing really at the bottom here to prove it other than you keep repeating it, right? And so even my character who is ostensibly a racist one of the conclusions he comes to is like you're this like doesn't really have any relationship to the real world and measurehead's like okay well at least you know you thought it through <laughs> and then he let me in um, whoa uh well i mean in, in specifically i think like my response is not a refutation mm-hmm. but it's a this is arbitrary and it's a you know just a way of organizing the world and measurehead is like exactly it is right mm-hmm. and like there there's a politics to that so he let me do it um, and he let me in. We had a long sideways com- conversation or, or side conversation where I could kind of prod him about his own racial heritage um, because he is Simonese, but he was born in Revachol. So, like, I could feel these kind of resonances with real world, you know, bad conversations that happen. Mm-hmm. Um, he supports the union. He's a union worker. And, uh, and I was able to be like, well, what? you know, how do you reconcile your race theory with Mm -hmm. the union, you know, communism politics? And he's like, okay, number one, uh, communism is the worst mistake that the Occidental haplogroup before ever made. Mm. Um, And the reason for that is, and this is kind of the history stuff you were talking about before, right? We are learning more and more. We talked about it last episode, but we're learning more and more that, you know, about the history of this region, that they had a communist revolution against the crown at some point, Mm -hmm. and that what happened after that was this kind of uh, neoliberal takeover, right, by something akin to the EU or the UN um, that has kind of left this uh, part of the world, this specific, you know, Martinet in, uh, you know, economically distressed, to for lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. And so Measurehead is basically putting that on the communist revolutionaries. He's saying this would never have happened if the communists had, like, figured their shit out. Um, but he does say that the reason that he supports the union is that Everard Clare and the union are the only people who will stand up to global capitalism. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so there is this kind of, of uh, double relationship, right, where... Uh, or, I mean, it's, it's you know, the real-life ideology of something like Strasserism, right? Like hardline nationalist, racist, um, uh, communistic politics, right? Mm-hmm. Um, he believes in standing up against capitalism. He believes in hardline racial nationalism. But he doesn't really believe in the other political things that come with it. So it's interesting to see the game kind of use real-world stuff to thread that needle here. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also some stuff here that I don't think, I, I don't know how to take it as designed, right? Mm-hmm. There's something really weird going on with the way that, I mean, obviously this whole thing is really weird, but I think sure. it's trying to, they're trying to like do something with uh, the ideology of racism. Mm-hmm. And whether they succeed or not, I don't know, but I think that obviously there's an intent here to have a complicated conversation. But the other thing, that the thing that I do find really weird is that Measurehead is a large, muscled black man who is surrounded by white women who are constantly being like fawning ooh, over him yeah and fawning also, over ooh mm-hmm. measure head get him ooh measure head you're so strong and there is something going on here that is uncritical i think about i don't know women's association with white nationalism or, or you know with racism in a general sense white women specifically their relationship to um racism uh, the, some sort of sexual relationship or, or, you know, I don't know, going on between, um, you know, white women and black men that's no, maybe it, uncritically being replicated. What Something the, going on the, here. The tone of it felt very groupy to me. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, there are very few uh, black people portrayed in the game. Yes. Like, actually. And I think that... Uh, it is like it does like stand out to be like okay it, why why is there this racial disparity portrayed in like the groupies versus the uh versus measurehead who's like the advanced race theory racist mm-hmm. it's it's and, it's strange I, I i definitely agree with you i caught that and then and and maybe this is a difference you know the the it could be a difference in reception in the sense of that 
the history there, and especially the way that that's been adopted in pornography, the way that white supremacists seem fascinated and fixated on the relationship between white women and black men, Mm -hmm. right? The history of miscegenation and the kind of, uh, you know, um, I mean, you know, the oppressive and violent subjugation that used that as its logic, right? Or part of its logic in the United States, that just might not be be the same situation from which these developers are coming from. And that's maybe the most charitable way I can read it, right? Mm-hmm. Is that this just reads differently in different situations. But I, I, in the same way that like the developers are obviously using the, the idea of a black man giving, like being the voice of racism, one of the strongest voices of racism in the game. Mm-hmm. They're using that to kind of work through how, racial ideology works right that it is a comprehensive system that many people can buy into and i you know i think that we can think that they failed here i don't think that measurehead particularly gives us anything other than a kind of i don't know opportunity for the developers to like i don't know pontificate about a situation here but i also don't feel like that that by buying in or being involved in this or anything like that i don't feel like i was you know Uh, I'm not being told that any of these things are objectively bad. And with this additional weird kind of relationship between sex and race that's going on here that doesn't feel like there's any kind of thinking about that going on. um, I don't know. The whole, (laughs) this is a long conversation to say, the whole thing feels weird. Mm. Um, I I think that, that it is a situation where the developers are trying to do commentary here. And I think that in some ways, like you were saying before, the amount of time you have to put into it with literally no result, I think that's on purpose. Um, and I think the idea that you can spend all this time thinking about advanced race theory in the game explicitly gives you many options to be like, yeah, this doesn't make any sense at all. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and even in the kind of tool tip or the explanation tip of advanced race theory in the thought cabinet, your like internal monologue explicitly says, yeah, it just doesn't seem to be, the mystery seems to be that it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, so that it's I think purely, that, that it is, a, it is purely a fulcrum or a tool that, yes. that one can employ. Like the, the real secret is it's something that you can tell the people dumber than you to get them on board or to attempt to like engage more fully. Yeah. Um, so the, the solution that's in there, I want, I want to read it. Uh, the solution, right? So, when you, whenever you put something in your thought cabinet, you have a problem, and then yeah. like a time limit goes through, or there's some sort of trigger case, and then you you are able to integrate it into your brain, and it has a solution. So the solution is this: um, everything is calm in the eye of the race storm. Your mind is lucid and bright. The mind bending phylogenics appear more distant, and to be fair, a little ridiculous. The great race mystery has cleared up. All that's left to do is to verbalize your thoughts, go and talk to Measure Head about your newly found insights. So, mm. you know, the conclusion that you come to, the solution to the advanced race theory is that it's explicitly a little ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, part of the reason that we've been doing this, right, is to, or that not we, but I've been doing this and kind of going down this road is to figure out, you know, what Disco Elysium's trying to do something by integrating these ideas and talking explicitly about race and ideology here. And what giving does you that the option. Produce? Giving you the option, you mm-hmm. know, and I'm trying to think what does that pr- produce? And as of this point, because I think Measurehead's a big kind of uh, moment in the game where that's happening, yeah. it doesn't really produce much of anything. I don't think that making me or asking me or uh, giving me the option to sit through all of this like very weird alternate reality race science and then giving me it's a little ridiculous at the end. I don't I don't know. I don't know what that does. Mm-hmm. Um, Did yeah. Kim react to any of this no so kim is almost entirely absent from this conversation um which is very bizarre yeah kim kim's commentary about my racism has dropped off almost to zero and it could be because i during that conversation we had after the racist lorry driver Mm -hmm. i said look man you know i but what if racism and he's like i'm not talking you know i'm not going to talk to you about this anymore that could be why maybe he's just not talking to me about it anymore I wonder, so I think one of the big questions remaining for me, because I think you're right, I think in terms of like, we're going to meet one other big racist I know in this game, mm-hmm. and we're probably going to have other other stuff come up, but in terms of like the big hallmarks, we've, we've seen a lot of them, uh, and Measurehead yeah. was like a big part, and that's a, that's a lot of content to work through. 
I think that if you're not super impressed right now, I don't know if this if this game's going to pull up on the on, on the on the stick, as it were. But I wonder if the these interactions, even though Kim is absent and is like shut down around it and is not engaging with you, I do wonder if it's going to like affect Kim's perception of you on other things moving forward and at the end of the game. That'd be the question I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the I, I guess another part of advanced race theory too as a thing is that it's completion. Um, so it, it's research like effects. So while I'm thinking of it, I have a negative one to drama. I'm fooled by the absurdity. Mm. So I'm like in it, right? Mm -hmm. Completion is plus one conceptualization. And the explanation of this is the mystery is mostly aesthetic. So it really is just about like, it's arbitrary, right? Mm -hmm. And rhetoric learning cap is raised by five. So it, I mean, it really does seem like if we're thinking procedural rhetoric -y kind of stuff here, right? Mm -hmm. the, it does seem to be saying, you know, at the level of the numbers that are going up and down here, that this is all extremely foolish and it's just rhetoric, right? Mm -hmm. But in the actual conversation, it's a lot more ambiguous. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I I don't know. We'll, we'll, we will go from there and we will learn way more stuff. So I um, I did all this stuff with Measurehead. He hit the button for me. I walked in the door. Mm -hmm. How'd you do it? I punched him in the face and then gave him a 360 kick. 360 <laughs> spin kick. Knocked him out and then I pushed the button and went through the door. Took me like 15 seconds. It seems like, yeah, God, I, I've spent probably a full hour <laughs> like resolving this. Yeah, I remember you messaged me and being like, it's taken me two hours to get to the Union boss. And I was like, mm. <laughs> I mean, I did other stuff, but yeah. Um, the So you didn't jump. I did not jump. Do you know what I'm talking about? What do you mean? Have you, So you've never jumped? Jumped from where to where? From the place to the other. No. Um, so you know how uh, you, you the uh, measure head, you can open the door, right? Yeah. Uh, you go into that, it's like a union office, and mm -hmm. then you can go outside and you like walk across a catwalk, and right outside the union office on that catwalk, there's your coat. Yes. Okay. You can go to the Kuno's ha uh, hideout. Have you done that? No, I wasn't able. I did. I wasn't able to recognize it. I like failed the check to recognize that there was a hidden entrance. Gotcha. So yeah, mm -hmm. behind the fence over near the Kuno, uh, you can you can find like this little entrance thing. And I just mm -hmm. I made the check, I guess, uh, to do it. And I walked in there and like found Kuno's stash of amphetamines mm -hmm. and his severed pig head that he keeps there. Yeah, and, it, and as it one does, as as one does, and it uh, there's a uh, uh, ladder. Mm -hmm. that takes you up to this uh, roof and you can jump from that roof to the catwalk to get your coat. Mm. Um, and I found this like last episode, I think I just didn't bring it up yet, but uh, I did not have like the capability to make the jump. So mm. I had, I had to go do the other way. I gotcha. Had I recognized the entrance, I think the entrance, it might've been like a uh, logic test or like, visual mm -hmm. calculus or something in order to determine that that was uh, like a false wall mm -hmm. um I, i'm sure i could have made it i think in a previous playthrough maybe i did but yeah could not did not see the entrance had to uh had to knock out this racist well that seems better than what i went for but i was just trying to learn about advanced you know race science i will say one of the groupies tells me after i knock him out you're the new measure head oh god yeah hmm well, good luck with that. No mm -hmm. one told me that, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I in, I went in the union office, uh, looked around, did a bunch of stuff, like read some fo file folders and things like that. Um, did you do anything interesting on your way to uh, talk to Everett Claire? Uh, there was a little switch, and I was able to turn it on, mm -hmm. and it ra it like lowered one of the shipping containers. Mm -hmm. And Kim was like, "Why'd you do that?" And I was like, "I don't know. It seemed it seemed kind of fun." And Kim was like, well, it did sound pretty cool. Uh, I did a bunch of stuff up here, actually. That's, that's interesting. That's like the one thing. Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Did, did you also do that? I did do that. Okay. Uh, I, uh, Kim, Kim did not say, that sound, that's cool. He was just like, why did you do this? <laughs> okay. Um, I also went, there was a little guard hut 
up yeah. on the wall mm-hmm. with a bunch of bot- empty bottles. Um, and I looked inside real quick, and there was like a little family photo that I took. And Kim was like, why'd you take that? And he's like, um, you know, I'm just taking it, and I'm investigating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did you learn about the bottles, too? Uh, no, I did not. Mm, uh, yeah, so I did the same thing. I took the photo, but I also learned that I could look at the bottles, and it, like internally in my mind, I was like, I'm pretty sure this was me. Oh, and no. then I then I talked to Kim, and Kim was like, "I was like, Kim, was this me? Did I do this?" And he's like, "Yeah, almost certainly." I mean, yeah, uh, especially given that your uh, inspector coat was hanging up here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, are you wearing your inspector coat? What's your outfit? I, I put on the inspector coat. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, it's pretty. Uh, it's it's pretty free and clear. Did you finally? Did you get your other shoe? Are you? I did. Too, too I, shoed I, now. I got it at the end of this episode since I was back at the hotel. I went went and got it. Um, I've also picked up all those bottles because what I'm carrying in my two hands, because you can equip all kinds mm-hmm. of stuff, I, I'm I'm carrying a crowbar in one hand and then my plastic bag for collecting bottles in the other. I got my plastic bag too. Um, gotta 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 make that dough. Gotta pay Gart at the end of day one, which I have technically not gotten to. Um, mm. Oh yeah, you need a hundred real. Yeah. Dang. Mm-hmm. Luckily, a rich person gave it to me. Um, but then you like walk into this thing and you talk to Everett Claire. Um, the first information of which I, I there's something very interesting to me and, and weird. Um, I will well, say well, one other thing before we, okay. we talk to Evar. I Go did. Uh, I feel very strongly that there's something in that shipping container. Yes, but you weren't able to open it. I wasn't able to open it. I tried to. I knocked on it. Kim's like, why are you focusing on that shipping cane container? And I just responded to him with another question, which is, why wouldn't I be? Why aren't you interested in the shipping container? And he said, because there's millions of them. So the thing I want to say about Everard Claire is that uh, this design is bad. Mm, mm-hmm. um, like like it is just leaning into like every fat phobic video game tropey thing yes uh, there's something really weird in isometric rpgs uh when michael and i were doing too much future i mean we're still doing too much future but when we did the too much future episode on um uh fallout one we talked about one of the episodes that has gizmo this character gizmo who is like sitting down at his desk and his character model is the desk it's like him and he's so big that he is part of the desk functionally Mm. and so like in combat when you're fighting him um he is the desk and that's exactly how everart claire is being done here and so like for a game that really is, I think, rethinking and kind of redoing a lot of things in the isometric RPG um, tradition, I think it's just such like a huge oversight. Um, I think in their desire to like produce the like snaky, uh, you know, um, I, I don't know, like fat cat boss, uh, you know, literally of the they, Indian. They were then, leaning hard on this, on this uh, fat cat trope yeah. with, with Everett. And I think that, it feels very lazy because there's a billion ways you can get across the fact that like the, the character of Claire um, mm-hmm. and it becomes immediately apparent, like what his character is doing and how he operates in your conversation with him. Uh, so no, I agree. It just feels incredibly lazy. And it also, it, it reminds me of, I think in, it's probably more pronounced in, some of the Fallout games and even in the early ones, but when you have character models that are just completely homogenous and then you make one extra fat character model for NPCs, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's so egregious. There's a little bit more body diversity in a game like Disco Elysium where they're kind of like independent uh, character models, but it still was, it reminded me of that. It reminded yeah. me of like that feeling when you like when you walk into the uh, that um, you know candle keep in and there's like the one fat shopkeep and there and like that, that's just like a character model that is totally unique from like every other character model in the game. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and they don't even get different clothes. Correct. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, that's first impressions. Um, but uh, I, you know, I don't. I wouldn't say that my. Maybe I'll I'll take a step back. I think the Evart Claire stuff is my least favorite stuff in this game, and not mm. just for like the reasons that we just talked about, but in that I feel like I am really railroaded 
very hard in my relationships with Claire in ways yeah. that I'm not in most other places. And to be fair, maybe that's on purpose, right? He does have a lot of power. He, you know, he is a character that can make me do things I don't want to do. But uh, it, it feels like in it's very contrasty to a lot of the other stuff. But but you tell me how this went for you. Um. Well, he told me, hey, have a seat. And I tried to do a power move because I'm a big, strong man. And I told him, you know, I think I prefer to stand. And then he insisted. And I was like, nah, not really a sitting type of guy. And it does contrast like he's in a very luxurious padded uh, chair. Mm-hmm. And and I do observe that chair looks, you know, the chair he's telling me to sit in looks very painful. Um, and it's actually very interesting it my like volition literally tells me you've already lost you cannot fight him on this you have to sit down it's either leave or sit down so i sit down Hmm. did you sit down yeah i had to i there's nothing else i could do oh Uh, interesting yeah i i i mean i i might have gotten a check to stand but it it didn't matter it was basically like repeatedly telling me you have to sit you have to sit and lo and behold i sit down and i start taking damage immediately from how uncomfortable the chair is oh so i sat down and my my uh body tells me this chair is awful this wooden chair is terrible but your butt is made of iron and iron (laughs) beats wood (laughs) uh that's good i guess Mm -hmm. but uh yeah so like i'm just like taking it it's like play, i'm playing world of warcraft here in this game right? i'm taking like damage over time and every like conversation beat i'm having to like use my health item to keep from dying mm. it's just it is not uh it's not, not what i was in for but uh, did you learn anything interesting here well he immediately uh starts calling me harry dubois yeah which i don't acknowledge there are several options where I can like follow up with him and be like, wait, is that my name? But I try not to do that. And then he drops it with little asterisks around them to like emphasize it. Your lost gun, mm-hmm. Harry, you know, um, well, surely you didn't leave your lost gun loaded. We know that didn't happen. And then like my brain is like, oh, my God, there are two bullets in that gun. <laughs> um, I didn't. I didn't have any kind of reaction to how many bullets I had. But he's like, he does say at one point, he's like, Sur- surely you didn't have your lost gun with children pointing it at each <laughs> other, yeah, in, in the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, I start. Uh, luckily, I had enough like morale, health potions mm-hmm. to navigate this. But I probably took morale damage two or three times during this, which is a real problem because I only have one morale. Dang. Um, but. Uh, Basically, basically, I don't get any information about the hanging or about the murder, rather. Uh, the information I get is basically he's like, hey, I can help you out with that, but I need help from you. And he tells me that he needs a door opened. The implication being he needs to he's go, he wants to send a message to whoever the resident of this home is that the police are on his side, that, you know, the Revachal city militia is 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 you know is his to control mm-hmm. um and that's like the condition of him like aiding us further and he also um he also you know says oh i'm sure i can help you out with your lost gun and uh kim says you know we're we're on that kim's kind of got my back is like yeah we're 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 actively working to recover that weapon um, and the last thing that happens is he hands me a big old novelty check for my <laughs> uh, stay at the um, at the uh, whirling whirling ra- and rags whirling rags, and uh, I take it. I don't I don't remember if I took I think I took the check. Uh, he also like holds out like a five real note at one point. And if and I could be like, why are you doing that? And he's like, I'm just holding the five real note in the air. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so he did like not do that of, with me. Gotcha. Yeah, there, there's like all of this kind of like I'm skirting the law and flaunting my ability to like make the law do what I want, but I'm not doing anything illegal. Mm-hmm. Don't suggest that I am. Um, how much how does this hit you vis-a-vis like? I don't know. This is the this is the portrayal of the union boss. Um, in the game so that you know the game is kind of uh making a statement about 
uh, the union. D- does it feel both sidesy vis-a-vis the, the way the game's treating class so far? Are you comfortable with it? Where I mean, are you on it? You know, the union is just another corp, right? Mm-hmm. Like at the end of the day, we don't, or, or at least at this point in the game, we don't have a reason to understand why the union is not just like any other corporation in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or the uh, what RCMP. Mm-hmm. RMP, whatever the the police, the yeah. British all police um, that we're a part of, right? That all of these seem like it's a pretty deep dystopia, right? And it's not sure. a dystopia of our world, right? But but from wherever it was before, in the sense that it is a world where their version of something like neoliberalism has hit everyone so hard that there's like nothing to do about it Mm -hmm. (laughs) um at some point here i was able to start thinking about like what am i going to be what are my political ideologies and i believe at this point in the game that i am both a nationalist and a communist Mm -hmm. and i don't remember exactly how those i thought i had notes about it but maybe i don't Mm -hmm. uh no i do i do i'm sorry it's in a different conversation we'll talk about in a minute but Mm -hmm. uh but yeah i mean basically i um you know i i am alongside my racism have adopted some thoughts about like maybe it's good for everyone to be united but maybe all those people should be united under like a strong nationalist fascist Mm -hmm. background um and uh everard i mean i don't know i mean i think it's just a i don't think that you that the game is saying all that much Maybe uh, this is a better way of putting it. Mm -hmm. We tend to think of unions in relationship to something like class, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. I don't think the game is making any kind of claim that uh, unions are actually good for workers in anything other than like a conceptual sense, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because they're just another corporation that's wielding power in the same way that all these other, uh, you know, kind of corrupt organizations are wielding power. Mm Mm-hmm. There's kind of a, like a, a race to the bottom of nihilism here mm. <laughs> or pessimism. Maybe it's not a, uh, yeah, this isn't a bright and sunny game. There's no, it, this feels like the kind of game where you play it and you're kind of in a position where as a player, you're like, I don't think there were that many good guys in this game. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, I think this kind of, I think we'll have to talk about this when we get to the end of the game, but, uh, you know, this game gets strongly associated with ideas about the, you know, the quote unquote dirtbag left, right? Um, all of the voices or the vast majority of the voices in the game are prominent, you know, quote unquote dirtbag left podcasters. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't know if you knew that. I don't think we've talked about that, but, um, you know. We will talk about that, I think, toward the end of the game. I did uh, recognize the woman who was smoking. I think that she was uh, in kind of like on late night television as the uh, the socialist Sailor Moon character. Like there was there, she was featured in a Alex Jones interview where uh, she said something along the lines of, I just want health care, honey. Something yeah. along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, it, yeah, but, uh, you know, it was one of the people, I think the podcast is Red Scare, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. We, I think we'll talk about that outside of like the content of the game at some point, because mm-hmm. I think that, that that changes the way of of dealing with it. But yeah, I mean, it, it is dystopian and hopeless in the sense that many places in the game, it feels like there's no way out. Um, and uh, so I don't know. I mean, I think it's just a really pessimistic and kind of compromised view of like what a union could and should be able to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that we have to make choices about whether we think that's good or bad. But we will learn more about the union. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, over the next couple days of game time. Yeah. Uh, Gotcha. So did you ask uh, what, what else did you, did you find anything else out from uh, Claire? I, I, like I said, there wasn't much in terms of like the crime and the mystery that you could really extract from him. It was, it was the same thing. I felt very railroaded and like, Oh wow, this feels like a very traditional quest giver from an isometric role playing game instead of like so many of the other characters I've met in this game. One hundred percent, I agree. Um, yeah, there, this whole conversation kept basically going around to "I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine" around opening this door, and uh, he kept saying that my name was Harry Dubois, um, mm-hmm. which I guess I assented to or just pretended like I knew that was the case the whole time. I didn't write any mm-hmm. notes down about it, weirdly enough. Mm-hmm. But um, what I did find out is because I went through the union office and read some files in the union office. Oh, He was reading from a file folder, and I was able to say, hey, 
you're just reading from a financial statement file folder. You don't have any information on me. Like you don't have a, a file on me specifically. And then I was able to like look at it and yeah, it's like a government file folder that has census uh, bureau information in it. Just nothing. Yeah. So he's <laughs> pretending to know about me, but he just literally knows like my name and my address and that's it. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I, I was able to get a sense that like, uh, a lot of this, like, um, I don't know, uh, you know, crime drama kind of vibe that's coming out of, of uh, the union boss is really just positioning and rhetoric. Um, and uh, so I didn't really get much beyond that. And I said, yeah, I guess I'll go like open this door. Um, and, and then I left. OK, did you ask him about the shipping container? No. Oh, did you? Yeah, I was asked him, "Hey, what's the deal with that shipping container?" And what he that? said, "And he said, what shipping container? There's there's <laughs> hundreds of shipping containers." And I was like, "You know, the one hanging on the crane." He's like, "I have no idea what's in that shipping container. It's not important." Yeah, but you um, think it's very important, is what you're telling me. He, but then he said, "Maybe maybe you should ask it." I mean, you should ask what the deal with the because he was like being a real jackass to me. By the way, the check he gave me. Um, was directly to Gert, the, mm-hmm. you know, the hotel manager. I mean, and <laughs> his name, I think his name's like Gart or G- Gert. Gert. Yeah. Gert. Mm-hmm. Call it Gert. Though. Gert. Um, and uh, it says, please pay the constables. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What a, what a baby's joke. What the fuck? I know. <laughs> so, obvious, so already I'm getting like this impression of like, this guy, Ever hates me. Is like yeah. the, the impression, but he he says like ironically, well, why don't you ask it mm-hmm. whether it's important? So that's what I did. My my rhetoric uh, skill succeeding is like, yeah, you should ask the thing. You should ask the shipping container. Well, what did it say? Well, I went outside and I asked the shipping container, and Kim was like, "What are you doing?" And then I uh, I had a another check, and it was a it was a check of a skill that I did not have is like a purple one. Mm-hmm. And I had a, once again, it was a legendary check with minimal chance of success. And I succeeded. <laughs> well, and I, I, yeah, what'd uh, you learn? It, well, the uh, voice came from inside and said, Oh, come on in. And he opened it. Huh? And I walked in and, uh, there uh, in front of me was like light bending around in the shipping container, like coming to a point and then kind of like spiraling outwards almost in a rainbow in the shipping container. And this kind of like figure that you couldn't really see very well because the light all uh, kind of contracted in like directly on his figure. So you couldn't really see him well. And then someone named the mega rich light bending guy spoke to me. <laughs> and okay. the and the mega rich light bending guy uh, introduced himself as Rustam Diodor, and he's an investor and uh, and a, a very wealthy man. And he told me, "Yeah, I, uh, I I kind of asked him, who are you?" And he told me, "Oh." Um, well, I am a very, very wealthy man and I inherited most of my wealth from my grandmother. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, um, think that being wealthy is just fun and games, but you know, it's hard work. It's hard work, you know, investing and, and making this much money. And also I, this is how I travel because I don't want to have to, you know, deal with, uh, poor people asking me for money. Well, did you get into why he can bend light around his body? Never. <laughs> there was one visual calculus check where it was like, it's giving you a headache even trying to figure out what's happening right now. Don't think about it. So I didn't think about it. Wow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I asked him for some money and he uh, gave me one real. What? And then I And then I said, this is barely anything. And he said, well, that's the that's the beauty of it. See, the real pleasure is in the hard work that it takes, <laughs> that it takes to earn this money. And there's several options here where I can like react to how he made his money. So I can react with, uh, you know, you should spread the wealth around, right? 
-hmm. you can react with, so you're just a parasite that, you know, that earns money off of other people's work. You can say, uh, you can say, wow, you know, you're, you're a real, uh, entrepreneur and you're great. Or you can just say, uh, you can just, uh, there was a dialogue option. It's like, I, I don't care about any of this. Uh, ask him, ask him for more money. And so I picked that one. And uh, eventually I asked him, hey, would you be willing? Uh, there was another check and it was a legendary check. And I was like, I've got to get this one because I'm on a roll and I failed it. Oh, 100%. Yeah. The, the legendary check was uh, pitch him an amazing investment idea. <laughs> and I fail it. And like my stammer is like, you know what you should uh, invest in? Um, the police. <laughs> and he was like, oh, well, you know, what, what would you invest in in particular? And uh, my physical instrument told myself, you need to tell him you need more guns. We need more big, big, big caliber guns. And I told him, oh, yeah, you need these big caliber guns. And he's like, so you're telling me I need to invest and give arms to an undertrained under-administrated, you know, militia police force. That doesn't seem like a good idea at all. And then Kim interjects and says, well, actually, the real issues with the Rivashal militia is just management. We don't have good interagency or, you know, inter-precinct communication, new technology to help communication, new management practices, some audits. These kinds of things are the things we need. And the investor's like, yeah, that does sound like a good idea. And I say, well, are you willing to invest? And he's like, oh, absolutely not. That sounds like a nightmare. You really, you really want to get the, you want to do some passive investments in so many little small things that it's impossible to lose. And that just seems like a whole bunch of work. And then I was like, oh, well. And Kim, there's a reaction from Kim of like him being just visibly disappointed. He's very sad. Damn. And uh, I take a morale damage from how like disappointed I am that the mega rich light bending guy will not invest in the police. And then uh, we, we say our goodbyes and he's like, so long. And we leave. Yeah. Kim believes in the police. Yes. Like he believes in doing, doing the job. It's so do I. Mm-hmm. That's why we're a great team so far. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> well, so, uh, yeah, because it took me so long to do the ever Claire stuff and the, all this union stuff. Um, I suggested that we then both talk to Joyce Messier mm -hmm. from Wild Pines, the woman on the boat that I talked to last episode. And I did some additional stuff with her because I had to burn two hours of in-game time thinking about racism. <laughs> so um, it, what did you, what was your conversation uh, with her like? How far did you go with that? Um, just, just what happened? Yeah, so I did go back, talk to the lady on the boat. This was me introducing myself. I ran into a really quick roadblock early because she asked me to identify myself and I did not have my badge. Hmm. How did you have this? Did you have this problem? I don't know. I think I said just don't worry about it or something. Oh, know. okay. I know what happened. So I was like, Kim was like, hey, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And I had an opportunity to try to negotiate mm -hmm. and I failed. Mm, I got you. Yeah, I think I, I must have just clicked through that mm -hmm. to negotiate. And, yeah, and Kim's like, what are you what do you do? And I think you've just promised to like do something for her before we, you know, before we can like ask her about this. And I was like, I don't know. It's everything seems fine to me, Kim. Uh and we talked to her again, and basically she wants us to investigate drug running that mm -hmm. could be, you know, facilitated by the union. Uh, before she's willing to tell us about, um, before, basically in order to overlook the fact that I lack my credentials. Yeah, I think I talked my way around that, but eventually you still hit that brick wall of she is not going to engage with you until you um, uh, do this quest for her, basically, of helping her figure out who... Uh, it's basically there are drugs coming out of the port here in uh, Martinet, Mm -hmm. And and they're going to other places in Revachol. And so the I, or the, the question is, which of the truck drivers, the lorry drivers, which of them is doing the smuggling? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's what she's interested in. And she has she basically says, like, 
uh, look, I've got a bunch of information for you about what's going on here and, and particularly information about the murder, but you got to kind of scratch my back before I'll scratch yours. Mm-hmm. Um, did you end up doing this quest? I did not finish the quest, no. I, okay. I started it. I also, um, I did not ask her for money. Mm. I remember not doing that. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, I have not finished the task. So now I have, like, two tasks, one from the union, one from the corporation. The union wants me to open a door. The corporation wants me to, to figure out something about these drug smuggling. Now, Kim believes that we can probably get by with just saying, okay, we've opened an investigation. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, I don't know how far that's going to go. Well, so did you open the door for Edward Claire? No, I knocked on it. Hmm, but you didn't open it. I did not open it. But in knocking on it, there was someone... Like, Kim was like, wait, that's not what we were supposed to do. Did you open the door? I, yeah, I opened the door and walked right into it. Oh, dang. I knocked and went away. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing that you really get... I mean, it's like kind of an unkempt room. Um, uh, the thing that you get, though, is that there's a shelf of racist coffee mugs. Oh, Mm -hmm. who was in there? No one was in there. That's what's weird is that if you knock and you heard someone because I walked in and there was no one in there. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So presumably that racist coffee mug that you found, which I have not found in my game, but that you found belongs to this kind of collection. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. What did you make? Like, were you able to inspect them? Uh, yeah, we looked at them and that's basically the information you get. They're like these, you know, these, um, uh, like racist caricatures in, you know, kind of coffee mug form and they exist and someone collects them and presumably that person is a racist. Uh, oh, and they have like a nationalist flag that mm. might actually be where I picked up nationalism. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so your thought cabinet, were you like in staring at this, you know, racist mug collectors, nationalist flag? The thought popped in your head of like, hey. Yeah, it, that only, yes. And so basically it's like, I, I think the th- it is nationalism, but I, the, the thought is fascism. And actually, once I completed that thought, it showed up in several conversations, which I'm assuming that's what's going to happen with advanced race science too, or advanced race theory is that mm-hmm. that's going to kind of keep showing up in conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm is not your, del- deleting it. Is your impression that you are kind of assembling yourself more or less tabula rasa because of the amnesia or is your assumption narratively that you were this racist and you're merely rediscovering who you were because i I think think, that's an interesting question yeah i i don't know i don't know if i have a strong feeling about it um i mean ultimately it doesn't really matter one way or the other because i'm you know fictionally creating this character toward a very particular end toward Mm -hmm. it so i guess it would have to be the first one that he was always this way and i'm rediscovering those things Mm -hmm. um the game seems to suggest that um because when these thoughts come up it is often in relationship to like you realize and you have these kind of latent ideas or thoughts inside of you, and then they are coming into fruition. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and sometimes those are capabilities too, like the, whatever the shit compression machine or whatever it yeah. was, uh, like that seems to be like a cap- like a cop capability that's in you. Right. Same mm-hmm. as the copper types, by the way, that has not come up again. So I think I accidentally like annihilated my ability to use the copper type, which is a, Oh no, I, yeah. I have not, I haven't been prompted with a copper type yet. Mm, haven't done enough cop stuff um but, but, I, but do yeah, have, I, I don't really know well one way it maybe it. maybe i have an anti cop type because i do have you think you're a rock star you're not a <laughs> cop you're actually a rock star well i think that's a type of cop though <laughs> okay <laughs> I, like in the cop type so i don't i don't know we'll find out as we mm-hmm. keep playing um, yeah so you knocked on the thing and you didn't go back to evart claire not yet, no. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, I went and did that already. So I went back and he was like, oh, what'd you do? And I was like, well, I went in and I found a bunch of racist stuff. And he was like, yeah. He, he said that I was going to be committing fratricide. My ra- He said, you're going to be committing fratricide, my racist friend. <laughs> oh, um, so you are known. They know. Yes, yes. Uh, people know that I'm a racist. And he told me that basically he had a second task for me, which is going and... Um, getting signatures from people to basically sign over a building 
And I think that's like way beyond the pale, so I'm probably not doing that. Mm. Um, I also I also did the quest for Joyce Messier. Okay. Um, and the, and that could probably will go very different from us. Uh, for mm-hmm. us, I basically figured out. I went and talked to all the different people, um, the different lorry drivers. They didn't really give me that much information. I had to really lean on one of them pretty hard and mm-hmm. uh, and basically found out that there was like one woman that everyone was kind of afraid of who was a lorry driver and she has disappeared. And I had to like really lean on this dude like super hard and intimidate him and use my kind of, you know, um, cop abilities, basically that, you mm-hmm. know, the, the threat of things I could do as a police officer to get him to give me the key to her abandoned um, uh, uh truck yeah two things that are interesting from that 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 also are not going to matter for you which is interesting so one is yes i determined that she is almost certainly the one who was doing the uh the drug smuggling the okay. other thing is that she has a the gas pedal of her truck has um sandpaper stuck to it and this being important because you unlike me looked at the footprints and you determined that the wear on one of the boots was greater than the other. Exactly. Whereas I never noticed that. I'm probably not even going to notice the the gas pedal difference, to be honest. Um, yeah. So she was there the night of the corpse being put in the tree. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I'm able to take all that back to Joyce Messier and be like, yes, we are going to open an investigation because it's clear that we, we didn't find any drugs or anything. Right. But mm-hmm. it's clear that drug smuggling is happening. There was all this additional information too about the radio in the truck, having like hundreds of different saved signals on it, implying that there's like a big communications operation going on. Mm-hmm. But I didn't really have more information about that. And then I talked to Joyce Messier and she gives me like a huge amount of information about what's going on. So I think probably I want to wait till you learn mm-hmm. that information so that we can actually kind of talk about it. But she she really kind of gives you a big lay of the land as far as like what politically is going or going on around this murder. That'll be good. And we'll kind of start the next episode with the big Joyce lore dump. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put that in our thing. Joyce lore dump for episode three Mm -hmm. um anything else happened in this episode for you anything interesting gosh what is that not enough are you not entertained i'm entertained uh did you did you talk any more to the kuno or kuno s i have not me neither i think that there's uh there are some side quests associated with them and that might be like kind of some content down the line when we you know there comes a point in this game where you kind of run out of main quest stuff and the game's pretty explicit about yep (laughs) point of no return so maybe maybe that'll be stuff we go back to yeah Mm -hmm. i think so Um, but yeah two legendary checks successful it's a it's a it's a great disco uh disco in elysium okay Mm -hmm. well we'll be back um on the next episode uh you can go to patreon.com slash range touch in order to support the show uh for as little as a dollar a month and we have all kinds of other stuff you can check out like too much future which is basically this show but for the fallout franchise that michael and i do game study study buddies which is where michael and i read uh books of game studies and then uh do stuff uh, talk about them explain them work them out um we've also got just king things which is where we read the works of stephen king and publication order and talk all about them uh by the time you're hearing this certainly uh we'll have released a bunch of episodes including our nearly four hour episode on the stand so Lord. um exactly good god also um, friendship with thousandarium ended my new best friend the drive for 1025 it's true yeah we are on <laughs> currently for the patreon we are on a drive for 1025 which is uh, we just want 1,025 patrons. That can be at a dollar a month or it could be at five dollars a month or anywhere in between, <laughs> I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you enjoy what we're doing and uh, you think and you listen to the show and you like it, then uh, maybe consider throwing us a buck a month uh, our way where uh, we have 350 uh, patrons or something like that at this point. And uh, so we got a long way to go. But mm-hmm. at the 1025 mark, there's going to be a very interesting surprise uh that i can't say too much about but but it might uh, be a debt jubilee 
<laughs> it might be. We're just gonna we're gonna just be buying. It's not. It's not gonna do that. Yeah, <laughs> we, that won't be enough money to do that. But, no. Uh, if only. If only it were. It will be a um, debt jubilee for one person. In the, like, we'll we'll you'll go to McDonald's and you'll be like, hey, put go ahead and put the person behind me. Uh, going, I'll, I'll pay for that. Mm-hmm. That'll uh, be the, the debt jubilee. No, it'll be a debt jubilee for me with my <laughs> huge amount of student loan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, a PhD ain't free, buddy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's the kind of analysis that you get at, at uh, Mages and Murder Dads. But uh, yeah, so please consider doing that. Um, also, I, I think I forget to mention this occasionally, but uh, if you go down to the description below this episode, you can find a link to the uh, um, uh, podcast feed for the show. So if you l- enjoy listening to the show and watching the show on YouTube, but you'd rather hear it as a podcast, uh, there's a link down there below where you can do that. Uh, we recently found out that lots of people listen to this as a podcast, which I re- didn't really realize before. Mm-hmm. Some people want to want to do it on their jog, and you can't like really mm-hmm. watch the footage while you're while you're jogging, dodging exactly. traffic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I support it, uh, and it's down in the description below if you want to do that. Sometimes I forget to call it out. I think that's it for this episode, Danny. That's it, everybody. Stay safe. Have fun. Ciao. <laughs>